I guess it's time to start the next uh, speaker. Um, so over to you, Walt, to introduce. Uh, Right, so uh, originally Jamie was supposed to speak yesterday and I was going to speak today, but then we decided to test the fault tolerance of this conference by changing the order of our talks. Um, so uh, we've passed with flying colors, it's good. I'm, I'm super excited to introduce Jamie uh, because it is rare to get such a perfect pairing of speaker and topic, right? The topic is the highly philosophical, what is a database? And... In some sense, I feel like Jamie has been asking this question with his entire career. Um, Jamie has worked on databases with radically different query languages and is known for his diatribes against SQL. So he's asked the question, what if a database had no SQL? He's also worked at a company that I think was running machine learning models inside the database itself, right? So that's kind of like asking the question, what if your database gave the wrong answer? Um, he, he also worked at a, a really cool company called Materialize, which you know is basically entirely materialized views. It's like, what if a database were turned inside out? And now he's working at this really cool company called Tiger Beetle, which is like asking, what if a database was good? Um, so so I'm, I'm really excited to learn from Jamie what a database is. And uh, yeah, please, it's gonna be good. Okay, uh, so what is a database? Uh, this is maybe kind of a weird question, but I think it's useful to think about the reasons that things are the way they are and uh, which parts are kind of fundamental to the problem and which are just accidents of history. Um, so I had a couple of like, different lenses for thinking about this question. Uh, I Googled web app architecture and I found a bunch of diagrams that look like this. So you can see there's a, the database over here, and there's a bunch of application servers over here. Um, and we can ask, why are those different boxes? Like, why are those not just one thing? Um, and who decides, like, what work gets done to the database, what work gets done to the application server? Um, another lens, uh, it's kind of hard to, to measure the size of big projects, but SQLite, as best I can tell, is about 150,000 lines of code. and. Postgres is between 500,000. I've seen some people say 1.3 million lines of code. And so why are they so complicated? Like, what are they doing? Like, why is the database not just like, write the data to the file? Um, and the third lens is, uh, most of the time we spend working with languages, uh, programming languages, uh, and pretty much all of them share the same basic set of features we have pointers and variables and, and loops, control flow, data structures. And then when we work with databases, we work with languages that are completely different. And so we could ask, like, why don't we just have regular program languages inside a database? And so I think probably the root, the, uh, like the most fundamental difference between programming languages and databases is that databases are the set of things we do when we have data that we care about that's going to last a long time. Uh, and when you're working inside a programming language, you're typically working with data in memory, which means that if your process crashes or the power turns off, it's all gone. Um, so if you care about your data, you're probably going to store it to disk, and disks behave very differently from memory, and a lot of the, the differences sort of originate there. Um, so I think there's probably like three big parts of any database. Uh, the storage engine, which is responsible for dealing with all the oddities of working with disks. Uh, concurrency control, which makes sure that different queries don't interfere with each other. I'm not really going to talk about that much because I don't really know much about it. Um, and the query language, which is how you like ask questions off the database. Um, so the storage engine. Uh, most of the complexity of the storage engine is just due to how different memory and disks are. So um, uh, there's a tool made by Intel, the memory latency checker. So I, I use this to benchmark the memory of my laptop uh, it tells me the peak rebound with about 42 gigabytes per second. Uh, the latency for a single read is about 17 nanoseconds. Uh, and we know from the data sheet that each time you read from memory, you get 64 bytes back. Even if you only want to read one byte, it'll give you 64. Uh, and so we, we can do the math here. If, we, if it takes us 17 nanoseconds to do a read, uh, we can, you know, one second divided by 17 nanoseconds times 64 bytes is only 0 0.83 gigabytes per second. So you can see that if you uh, 
do your reads to memory sequentially, you are not getting anywhere near the full bandwidth of your memory. Um, so there's a little loop here. Uh, we've got an array, about really big array of integers, and we're just going to loop over the whole array and XOR the numbers together. And we can do sort of like back of the envelope math from the, the numbers we have, 17 nanoseconds uh, per read means about 14 million reads per second. Um, each iteration of this loop is reading about is reading eight bytes, uh, and we know that we get 64 bytes per memory read. So every eight iterations, we're going to have to read from memory. So we expect to get about 112 million iterations per second, which is this 0.83 gigabytes per second. But if I actually run this on my laptop, I get uh, three billion iterations per second, uh, 23 gigabytes per second, which is almost like the most uh, throughput that you can extract from a single core. So something weird is going on here that doesn't make sense. Like we. <laughs> Um, so the answer in this case is uh, there's a component inside the CPU called the prefetcher, which looks at the pattern of memory accesses you make. Uh, if they are predictable, if you're just striding through an array, uh, then it'll start jumping ahead of you. It'll start issuing reads to memory long before you actually get there. Um, and this means that effectively you have very high concurrency, even though you wrote what looked like a simple sequential loop. So we can make life hard for the prefetcher. Rather than striding through this array, we'll... Uh, uh, look up a random number each time. Um, and so, again, 14 million reads per second. Uh, in this case, we get, we expect to only get one iteration per read because these are random and the cache is much smaller than the array. So uh, mo the vast majority of the reads will not be in the cache. So we expect to get 14 million iterations per second of this loop. Uh, and then when I actually run this on my laptop, I get 51 million. So again, not as big a difference as last time, but still much better than can be explain our like uh, simple, naive model of uh, how memory works. Um, so the difference here is uh, pipelining and speculation. So if I go back to this previous slide, when we look up a number from this array, uh, the CPU doesn't just hang around waiting for the memory to return. It continues executing the next iteration of the loop, um, even guessing what the result of the memory read will be if it has to. Uh, and if it encounters another memory read while it's looking ahead, it'll, it'll issue reads for those as well. And so it's still up to, able to obtain quite a high amount of concurrency, even though you wrote just a simple sequential loop. Uh, so now let's look at the disk. Um, uh, FII was a tool for measuring the performance of a disk. Uh, so on my laptop, I get about 2.6 gigabytes per second read bandwidth if I issue lots of concurrent reads. Uh, if I just issue one at a time, the so latency is about... 50 microseconds per read. Um, and the block size on this disk is four kilobytes. Uh, it's not actually four kilobytes internally, but it is pretending to be. So we do the math here. We see we expect for sequential reads to get about 20,000 reads per second. Um, and that works out to 78 megabytes per second, which, like the memory, is much, much less than the uh, full capacity of the device. Uh, so if you write, this is quite a lot of code, but uh, this is just a, a loop that goes over a big file, um, reads in a random block into memory, XLs all the numbers together. So the, the, the disk equivalent of the previous code. Uh, and our back of the envelope math tells us we get about 20,000 reads per second out of this. Uh, when I actually run this, I get about 18,000. So uh, unlike when we're working with memory, we don't get any assistance from the hardware here. If you write simple sequential code, you'll get simple sequential behavior. Uh, and then you're completely wasting the capacity of your device. Uh, so another big difference is constructs for ordering. Um, so here's some simple code um, running in two different threads. So the first thread is uh, taking some messages, and it's going to append them to a log and update a variable which points at the end of uh, the log. Um, and the other thread is just in a loop printing out whatever message at the head of the log. Uh, and if you actually run this, this will probably stack fault. Uh, and the reason is that the CPU doesn't necessarily issue writes to memory in the order you wrote them in the code. Uh, you would never encounter this in a single threaded program, but in, in multi threaded programs, each thread might see a different ordering for the writes. Um, so there is a, a construct that lets us uh, place limits on how much the CPU can reorder operations, called a fence. Um, so 
this uh, corrected version of the code. I'm about 40% confident this is actually correct now. I'm not very good at threaded programming. Um, but the rough idea is we want to say that the message always has to be written to the log before we update the head variable. Um, and in the other thread, we want to always want to read the head variable um, before reading the log at the end of the head. So this like forces the two threads to um, have a like a common ordering on these operations. Uh, on a disk, we can run into the same kind of problem. So, uh, so suppose we have a, a client talking to the database, and the client wants to send this message. So the database talks to the the cache. Um, this could be like the operating system cache, or there's also caches within the disk, and uh, lots of queues in various places. So there's a, a lot of places that writes can live before they actually make it to the physical disk. Um, so the database says to the cache, I want you to append this message to the log, and the cache says to the disk um, to actually commit, commit this write. And the database says to the cache, I want to update the value of the head variable. Um, and that makes its way to the disk. And then they basically response to the client, like, OK, great. We did all the work. Uh, you can rely on us always having this message in future. Um, and this probably will work fine if you're just testing this uh, in kind of an ad hoc way. Uh, but there's actually a bug here. Because the cache doesn't have to write things to disk in the same order that you gave it to them. So here, uh, the database says to the cache, uh, I'd like you to append this message to the log, and the cache says, sure, I'll do it later. And then we update the head variable, and that actually makes its way to the disk, and then we crash. Uh, and so now what we have on disk is a head variable which points to a part of the log that doesn't exist yet. Uh, and so when we try and recover after this crash, um, we'll have a corrupted database. We, we won't be able to read it. So like when we have fences in memory, uh, for interacting with our controlling order on the disk, we have fsync. Um, so after we send this, uh, append this message to the log, we call fsync. Um, and the cache promises that it'll do all of the writes that have happened up to this point before returning, OK, the fsync's good. Um, then we update the head variable uh, and return OK to the client. Uh, this code is actually still wrong. Um, Because what could happen here is uh, we append this message to the log, um, we have sync, and we update the head variable uh, and return OK to the client, but the, that hasn't actually made its way to the disk yet. So after we recover from this crash, we will uh, have a head variable pointing to the previous message and we'll overwrite the latest one and we'll lose data. So we actually have to have sync twice. So we write to the log, have sync update the variable, the, the head variable, and fsync again. Um, so fences in memory are relatively cheap. They really only restrict the ordering of operations. And so you can lose some like pipelining performance because of this, but the actual cost of the fence itself is not that high. Um, but fsyncs are incredibly expensive, unfortunately, because they combine controlling ordering with controlling the flushing of the cache. And even if you only want to control the ordering, you still have to pay for the whole cache flush. So I tried uh, with FIO again, adding an fsync after every write. Uh, and this cuts the bandwidth by about 20 times to the disk. Uh, and even if you go all the way up to fsyncing you know, every 4,000 writes or so, it's still a pretty high impact of performance. And so a lot of the complexity of storage engines is trying to figure out how to avoid calling fsync as much as possible while still being correct. OK, and then the final difference is reliability. Uh, it's kind of hard to find like really good numbers on this, but uh, Google had this paper uh, on DRM errors in the wild. Uh, and so <coughs> DRM chips, uh, when you store a byte, they store some additional bits to, um, for redundancy. Uh, if you have a single bit get flipped by some kind of mechanical failure, they can recover this. Uh, and if you have two bits flipped, they can at least detect it and warn you. Uh, and so Google saw for every RAM stick, about 8.2% of them per year had correctable errors. Uh, about 0.22% of them had uncorrectable errors. And then we don't know how many had more bit flips than that because it can't detect those. But uh, you can assume it's sort of like in the same progression. So there's going to be a very small number. 
Um, there's another series of two papers for disks. Uh, a latent sector error. Uh, a latent sector error is when uh, part of the disk stops responding to reads or writes, uh, maybe temporarily or maybe permanently. Um, these are pretty easy to deal with because at least you get an error. Um, but about 0.042% of their disks per year silently corrupted their data. So you write something to the disk, and when you go to read it later, you get back something slightly different. Uh, and this corruption is not detected. Uh, you have to do this yourself in software. Uh, and then finally, I couldn't find any numbers for the rates of misdirected reader writes, but uh, occasionally when you write to a disk, it will write the data you gave it, but to a different place. Uh, and this is very difficult to deal with. <laughs> um, uh, and so those studies are, are pretty old and for pretty old hardware. Uh, and so I don't know if the like, exact number is hold today, but general like experience from like working on large scale software is you can generally trust memory. It's probably uh, not going to silently corrupt your data and the disk absolutely is. And if you trust it, it will let you down. Uh, so there's some of these hardware differences. Uh, working memory, you have a hardware cache. The CPU analyzes your code to do prefetching, pipelining, speculative execution. execution. Uh, fences are really cheap, uh, so you can use them whenever you need to control ordering. Um, and the most common errors will either be automatically corrected or at least detected and give you an error. Uh, when you're working with the disk, uh, you have to write your own cache, you have to do your own prefetching and pipelining. Um, F-Sync is incredibly expensive, and so you have to go out of your way to come up with designs that avoid even needing it. Um, and the disk does not detect corruption and does not detect mis misdirected reader writes. So a lot of the complexity of the storage engine is just from doing all this stuff in software that you get for free in hardware when you're working uh, in memory. Uh, okay, so uh, the query language. Um, we have all these like SQL, GraphQL, Cypher. Um, there's been sort of an explosion of query languages lately. Uh, why do they exist? Like, why do your databases not just run regular programming languages? Um, I think one way to find an answer for this is, uh, oh, sorry. So query languages offer latency hiding, um, concurrency hiding, and data independence. I'm not gonna talk about data independence much because it's there's pretty good explanations online. You can just look this up on Wikipedia. Uh, but the other two, I think, are interesting. So back to this diagram, uh, we want to ask, you know, we were asked why some things are in the database, some things are in the application server. So uh, there's this law, Amdahl's law, which governs the speed up you can get by paralyzing software, depending on how much of the problem is paralyzable and how much of it is inherently sequential. Um, you can know this equation because I think what we actually work with in practice is what I'm going to call half-assed Amdahl's law, where if your problem is very easy to paralyze, you scale it horizontally, you buy a bunch of, run more processes, buy more machines, and if it's not, you find a library that does the problem for you. And so we can understand this diagram as, as being, in the application server, we're dealing with HTTPS, uh, decoding parameters, um, routing, uh, HTML templates, all our business logic, and all of this stuff is completely separate per client request. And so it's very easy to paralyze. Uh, and then everything else, everything that requires some level of coordination between these clients, uh, you just throw it in the database and let someone else deal with the concurrency for you. So that still doesn't explain why we need query languages. So let's suppose that our database just exposed a very simple key value interface. Um, and we want to uh, get a list, in this case, of uh, all of our users and how many like, blog posts each user has made. So we're just going to loop through all the users and then for each one look at the posts um, and, and collect the length. If you think about how this will behave on the network, when the client asks for this page, the app server is going to send to the database, uh, I need a list of users, and the database sends back all the users. And then it says, uh, okay, I need all the posts for user one, and the database sends back all those posts, uh, and so on and so on. So this ends up being a lot of traffic over the network, and all these intermediate results we didn't actually care about. We only needed them to compute the final result. Uh, and so sending them over the network is a total waste. So what we could do instead is take that snippet of JavaScript and just send it to the database and have it execute locally. And now everything is living in the same process. Uh, we save a lot of network traffic. 
So there's this idea of uh, sending code to data rather than data to code, um, because your code is generally much smaller than your data. Uh, so that was the latency hiding aspect of this. Um, if you look at now, like, what this would look like on the disk, um, we have the same set of calls that we had going over the network going to the disk, and these calls are sequential, and we've already established that doing sequential reads is terrible for performance. So it'd be really nice if something could take our little snippet of JavaScript and find the concurrency in it. Like maybe issue all of these uh, lookups to the number of posts per user concurrently, uh, rather than doing them one by one. Uh, so there's a couple of ways we can get this concurrency back. Uh, if you have a lot of queries running, you could just run each one with purely sequential I.O. and just hope you have enough queries at a time to, to get your concurrency back. Um, uh, or you could try to, for a single query, uh, extract some amount of concurrency for it by analyzing the code. So uh, so we have the SQL query, which is doing the same thing as uh, the previous snippet of JavaScript. Uh, when this hits a database, we'll get some... Uh, it'll be translated into a plan that looks like this. Uh, so we have uh, a scan of the users table, and then within that, a loop that is looking at the post for those that particular user and counting them. Uh, and then the database will perform some automatic transformations on this to slowly pull stuff out of that loop by reasoning about the dependencies of each operation. Um, so rather than counting the users within the loop, we can wait until the loop's finished and then group by users and count, count the post. Uh, and eventually we can transform this entire query into something that doesn't actually contain that, that big outer loop at all. Uh, and then each of these uh, nodes in this graph is a simple operation, which may be running an interpreter or something. And each of those operations, we can do the prefetching for in a pretty generic way. So uh, for example, here we're, we're scanning the users table. Um, and our scan function might look something like this. Uh, so this is like purely sequential. We're just going to look over the addresses in each table and one by one uh, run some callback uh, on each of the, the blocks within that table. And then transforming this to something that does prefetching is very simple. Uh, all we have to do is, uh, for each iteration of this loop, uh, look a, bit a little bit ahead and start the reads early before you actually get to them. And this is where you have to keep uh, prefetch count amount of reads in flight and like, use the actual uh, bandwidth of your disk. So why does this work for SQL and not JavaScript? Like, Why can't we just do the same transformations in JavaScript? Um, the answer to this comes back to or, sorry, if you ask people online, people will say it's because SQL is declarative. And this is a terrible answer. It doesn't actually mean anything, and no one can agree what declarative means, and it doesn't tell you really what is important about a language in, when you're designing it to, to get these properties. Uh, you might as well just say SQL is full of magic beans. Uh, I think the main thing that's actually important is going back to this graph. These are the... Uh, the sort of the data flow of the, the operations within this graph. And we can see for each operation, it's very clear what data that operation depends on. If we try to do the same thing for this JavaScript code that we had earlier, uh, we might say like, well, the results depends on posts and the user. Uh, the user comes from the db.users and so on. Um, except this is all wrapped in the loop. So we actually have for each iteration, some of the variables in that iteration of the loop depend on the previous iteration of the loop. Uh, but then once you actually start trying to do this in practice, what you realize is that every single one of these is a pointer to the heap. Uh, and they might all be a pointer to the same thing. Uh, any of these variables, or changing any of these variables could change any of the other variables. So your, what your graph actually looks like is, for every loop iteration, every single thing might affect anything that's on the heap. And anything that's on the heap might affect anything in the next loop iteration. Uh, so it's pretty much impossible to do these kinds of transformations uh, at a large scale for uh, imperative programming languages. Um, even uh, we, it seems like some progress at like great cost for vectorizing very like simple numerical loops, but um, for the kind of code you see in a database query, we basically uh, don't have a way of doing this. So when we work in programming languages, pretty much everything is a pointer to the heap. Uh, 
any two pointers to the heap might be a pointer to the same thing, so changing one might change the other. Uh, any function we call might change anything on the heap, and anything that can access a pointer can potentially use that to find other pointers on the heap and access anything else. So there's basically no way at all to determine the actual data flow of a program. And this explains why query languages are weird. Like in query languages, we tend to work with IDs rather than pointers. And IDs are nice because they're not a capability. If I give you an ID, you can't do anything with it unless I also give you a table to look it up in. And so unless a function is taking this, this table or this index, uh, we can be sure that it doesn't uh, have any dependencies beyond the ID itself. Um, we also typically have snapshots or something like this, some form of concurrency control, so that you can be sure that while your query is running, the data is not changing underneath you. You don't have to worry about, uh, especially if you're writing a query that is like inserting back into the database, you don't have to worry about your inserts conflicting with the, the query that you're reading. Uh, and our changes are atomic, so you execute your query and at the end we apply all the changes at once. Um, so reordering the query uh, part can't uh, lead to reading uh, like a different results from the database because you changed half of it. So there's a bunch of obvious complexity that comes out of this. You might have to make a whole new language. Um, you need a query planner and optimizer uh, because these query languages don't really specify typically like the ordering of events or the ordering of operations. And that's important because it allows the compiler to reorder it. But now the compiler has to pick an ordering. Uh, and if it doesn't do it well, they'll be incredibly slow. And so uh, it's, uh, you, you kind of require like lots of like engineer years of effort going into a, an optimizer before the query languages actually become particularly useful. Uh, and then some kind of plan interpreter or compiler. Uh, historically, SQL databases mostly interpreted their queries, but nowadays the latency of, of disks is getting so low that old school query interpreters are becoming CPU bound. And so it's becoming more and more common for databases to include an entire compiler to compile the queries in native code before running them. Uh, and then the user of the database is not is writing in a regular programming language. And so they need some kind of support usually for gluing together a bunch of strings to create this query uh, and some way of like turning results from the database back into uh, a native object. Uh, so this is like, sort of explains a lot of the complexity that's like directly attributable to queries. Uh, but there's a bunch more that I think is like not super obvious at first. Um, and it comes down to code duplication. So often if you're writing a web app, for example, you have a bunch of business logic uh, and it's very difficult to avoid writing all your business logic both in SQL and in the, the application server. Uh, and as a result, people try to use the query language as little as possible because they don't have to write all their code twice. So there's this fun paper by Peter Bayless called Feral Concurrency Control. Uh, they uh, analyzed a bunch of Ruby on Rails apps to find out how they, if they were not you know, using all the features of the database, how do they enforce their invariants? Um, and the answer was they mostly didn't. They, the, way, the code they used to enforce their variants didn't actually work because it was uh, written in the application server, which doesn't have the access to the concurrency control that the database does. Uh, I think a lot of people kind of read this paper as like making fun of Ruby on Rails programmers, but I think it's a should be more of an indictment of like databases. Like we created all these amazing features, and then to get access to them, we insist that people write it in a completely different language and a completely weird language and duplicate all the code. And so I think that there is a like a very strong need to figure out how to more. Um, like tidally integrate the two. Um, but we've seen uh, in the previous slides all the reasons why this is very difficult. Okay, so to sum up, the big components of a database, the the big things that like take up all the code in these repels, the storage engine, which we need because this are really unpleasant to work with, uh, concurrency control so that you can have multiple clients uh, horizontally scale out the parts of your app that are not in the database, uh, and the query language which we need to um, allow the database to uh, automatically analyze your queries and extract as much uh, performance out of the disk as possible. And then the underlying reason for all of these is just that you have data that you care about that you want to last a long time, and so you're forced to put it on a disk. Uh, and 
uh, pretty much everything else in the talk sort of like stems from this. All right, that's it. Awesome. Who's, who's going to ask the first question? Thanks, Jamie. Awesome talk. Um, you mentioned at the end, but I want you to dive a little bit deeper on what you think the future of accessing data will look like. Um, I mean, we've seen a proliferation of tools lately that are doing stuff from like doing pre-compiling to code gen to building client libraries that sort of abstracts a little bit of their way, but they all seem to basically piggyback a little bit what they were talking about earlier with like um, Larisse and uh, Andrew were talking about how controlling the, like taking out LLVM seemed like a key step to controlling that destiny. Like, yeah, I think it's something along those lines, but I'd be curious to see what you think about that. Um, well, I think the way the tag bit was written is interesting, uh, which is why I'm working there. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of the problems in this talk come from this fundamental assumption that the database is a thing that you, somebody else compiles and then hands to you. Um, and so your queries have to go through like compiler and interpreter at runtime. Uh, whereas in Tagabeetle, your business logic and your database are the same binary uh, and they're compiled together and you do all the work at compile time. Uh, and that also means that all the business logic in Tagabeetle is just operating on like uh, regular native code. Um, at the moment, Tagabeetle, like there's a bunch of like manual prefetching logic in the, uh, the business logic, but uh, I think there's probably ways to, to make that more generic and to, um, yeah, I, I like the, so the, the problem of, uh, having clear data flow, like data dependencies is doesn't really intrinsically require different languages. It just requires writing your logic in some more structured way. And we see like a lot of things like, um, uh, like Flank or like Kafka streams, uh, where you're writing code in like Java uh, using an API that has like map and reduce and operators like this. Um, and those kinds of APIs are like equally capable of doing these kinds of uh, concurrency hiding transformations. So I think at least the future I'd hope to see is, is databases where we access, um, access them through like directly through APIs um, that feel native to your language um, and, ex and compile them into the same process and that avoids the need to uh, have this entirely separate language as a way of like transmitting the code to the data. That was kind of a rambling answer, but <laughs> thanks. Awesome, well, you next. Thanks. There's sort of an, this is like a related question. There's sort of an empirical relationship where the more powerful and expressive your query language, the harder it is to write a query planner and optimizer for it. And also the easier it is to uh, accidentally write a query that is impossible to optimize and that will be super slow, right? So when you have like a key value store, every operation that you could do against it atomically is really fast, but it's not expressive. And then SQL is like kind of somewhere in the middle. And then like graph query languages are very expressive, but basically impossible to optimize. Like to what extent do you think this is a fundamental trade-off or do you think there's like a frontier that we could push and get better? And uh, yeah, what's the future here? Um, I don't know. Like, I think there's certainly room here for like better languages and better theory. Uh, like in SQL, for example, Subqueries in SQL massively improve the expressiveness of it, but for a long time were just not optimized efficiently. Um, but that has pretty much changed. Like I think uh, CargoHDB, for example, has like pretty good subquery optimization. Um, and subqueries in particular are, are almost like a key, uh, like kind of expressiveness. They 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 effectively allow you to write for loops, which is something that I think was a really frustrating thing to be missing in all other query languages for a long time. Um, yeah, I don't like, I'm sure there is like some inherent trade-off, but I don't know if we're like on the Pareto frontier yet, or if we're just like missing something really obvious. King's got a question. Uh, while I get there, I've got a question too. So can you tell us about our trade boy, Jamie? Um, oh, sure. Well, I, I ran a conference last year. I don't know if there's going to be another one, so it's not super exciting to tell you about, uh, <laughs> but you can go watch the videos from the last one. It's, uh, 
Um, can I look it up in here? Uh, no, I don't have any internet. Never mind. Uh, so the conference is called Have You Tried Wrapping a Database on It? Uh, and I was just experimenting with, uh, if you're going to do an online conference, all the other online conferences I've been to just took physical conferences into the exact same form factor. Uh, and whenever I went to an online conference like that, I would just fall asleep. I can't like sit and watch a video for eight hours straight. And so I tried to figure out uh, how you can like take advantage of the of the medium to make it more dense. So all the talks were pre-recorded and like very heavily edited. Um, most of the talks had an hour's worth of content, but edited down into 10 minutes. Um, and then while the talks were playing, the speakers would answer questions on chat. So we could uh, like have this like very interactive experience rather than having to wait for the speaker to finish talking before you get to ask them anything. So um, I know you work on the storage engine and I know you have like uh, experience with like query planners and such. What do you think is the primary thing holding back performances of most databases? Because an experience sometimes like at the IO layer, like the POSIX API is not well suited for um, expressing concurrent file IO, like you said before, like sequential writes instead of like multi-parallel writes. So that's at the uh, IO layer. Like, is there anything like that at the query layer, at the language layer, at the database consumption layer, or just even like API design? Um, there's a bunch of the hardware layer. Like I said earlier that the SSCs are lying about being four kilobyte devices. Um, they're basically emulating an interface that made sense for hard disks. And there's been a bunch of efforts to introduce a new interface, which actually, uh, I guess is not lying, like realistically communicates the uh, underlying characteristics of the device, but none of them have like taken off yet or, or achieved like enough uh, adoption to make it feasible to write a database for them. Um, and so the end result is that by when they pretend to be a 4 kilobyte block device, they have to do a lot of work internally. Um, usually about something like 30% of the capacity of the SSD is reserved for garbage collection. Uh, and then you have these like really weird performance quirks where uh, the right amplification, like the amount of right work that the the SSD has to do for every write that you give it uh, can become really high, like as high as like 40 times uh, when the SSD starts to become full because the garbage collection is just churning on like the tiny amount of free space that it has left. Um, and then we have like log structured databases, which you build on top of a log structured file system on top of a log structured SSD. And at each, like each one of those layers, uh, the and the layer above will have a bunch of garbage, but the layer below doesn't know it's garbage and so it'll like waste a bunch of time trying to collect it and also like waste a bunch of capacity leaving space for garbage collection. And so if we could collapse some of these layers, it'd be a big uh, difference. Hi, um, thanks very much for an awesome talk and also your awesome blog, which has been a, a great inspiration for myself and some of the folks I work with. Um, so so uh, I'll try and be quick. Just a, pushing a shameless plug that if you're interested in query languages, I will be giving a, a lightning talk about an attempt at a query language after lunch called prequel. So if you're interested in that, please be sure to come to that. Cool. <laughs> Hey, Jamie, um, I have two questions um, and they're connected. One is, I don't, uh, if, yeah, I don't know if you'll note, but just uh, why do we fight with the operating system so much? Or, or like, why do database developers fight with the operating system so much with like F-Sync? Um, and then a follow-up to that is, um, have you heard about, or I only recently heard about the NVMe key value storage um, APIs. And I'm curious if you've heard of that, do you have any thoughts? on how that will change the way database developers work with disks. Um, so fighting with the operating system, I think it's just a matter of like the speed at which things move. Uh, like every layer below the database um, has to maintain some level of backwards compatibility. And so you end up with all these APIs that are pretending to be things that they aren't. Uh, and the like impedance mismatch between them ends up being pretty bad. Um, and then, like specifically, the the, the F sync gate problem. Uh, so, if you haven't heard about this, uh, turns out most Linux file systems don't correctly report F sync errors. Uh, they will. Uh, so you you have a bunch of uh, pages in cache. Um, some of them are marked dirty because they haven't yet been written to disk. Uh, when you F sync, it will sync them all to disk and then mark them as clean. Um, if the disk returns an error for F sync, it will mark them as clean anyway, and so those pages will never be written to cache. 
and so if you use the operating system cache, you basically don't have any way to handle this case correctly. Um, but I don't think that's like particularly unique to operating systems. Like most databases also don't handle errors correctly. It's and <laughs> I, I, like I hopefully like things like antithesis will will change this. Um, but even like Jepson before, it's just like if you do any kind of testing of failing modes at all, like most databases fail. Um, and then the NVMe key value data store, like I know that exists. So that, that's about it so far. Um, I don't know if I can get access to one, and so I'll, I haven't really looked into it yet. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are using IO Euring. Um, can you describe really quick what that has enabled and like why that, uh, what, what that helps you, what problems that helps you solve in these cases? Oh yeah. Uh, so the main problem is that uh, NVMe drives are so fast that when you make a recall, like most of the time, is actually taken up by the syscall, um, and so IO Euring lets you. Uh, batch a bunch of IR requests together. So rather than like doing a syscall for every single read, we'll do one syscall for like a hundred reads at a time. Um, this just amortizes the cost of the system call. Um, yeah. um, if you got to do a clean slate rewrite of the operating system on current hardware to match database principles, what would you change? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure much of the stuff in the operating system would change because we bypass most of it anyway. Uh, I think changing the interface to SSDs would be a bigger deal. Um, and then the operating system side, I think like we bypass everything except the file system. And I think we we could get gains out of bypassing, bypassing the file system too. But we're, we're planning to bypass that as well. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Um, I think this is the case for like most high performance applications. Like you end up using Linux for your control plane and then everything that has like a high volume of data, you just take control of yourself. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, you seem to know a lot about databases. Uh, I was hoping you would help me um, learn how to use a database that I've been I've been trouble uh, utilizing. I cannot even get the thing to store data in it. It's called GDB. Can you help me later? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> Hey, thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Jamie. <laughs>